Hello, my name is Selena Caesar Chavan. I'm the senior advisor for EDI initiatives at Queens University and author of the best selling book, Can You Hear Me Now? And I'm ready to get started on digging deep. I'm Mark Sutcliffe, and I'm on a quest to learn from the best. Welcome to Digging Deep, presented by Zen Books and Abacus Data. This is the latest in our series of one-on-one -on -one conversations with thoughtful, interesting people who come from many different fields. In February of 2019, Selena Caesar Chavan was on the phone with the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau. And she didn't like where the conversation was going. So she used a profanity, not once, but twice, in asking the Prime Minister who he thought he was talking to. How did things end up there? Selena Caesar Chavan had been a successful business person and a community leader before she ran for parliament in 2015. She was elected as part of a sweeping liberal majority, and she was regarded as one of the most interesting new figures in parliament. In fact, she was handpicked by Trudeau to be his parliamentary secretary. Caesar Chavan saw it as an important role and a big opportunity. But she says she quickly became a token in the Trudeau government. She was sent to only three international events, and she says each one was directly related to her being black. She also felt like she was unable to speak with her own voice. All of this, including her very heated conversation with the Prime Minister and Cesar Chavan's decision to leave the Liberal caucus, is explored in a very candid new book called Can You Hear Me Now? And there's so much more as well, all of which we will get to on this episode of Digging Deep. We'll talk about her relationship with her grandmother, how she carved out a successful career in business, including how she managed expectations as a black woman in a field dominated by white men, and also the challenges that arose in her marriage. We'll talk about authenticity, integrity, and why diversity is actually a low bar to set. Cesar Chavan has a lot of powerful and thought-provoking perspectives to share. Now, one last thing before we get started. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to this podcast and post a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. And also, share Digging Deep with your network. And if you're looking for more information, please go to letsdigdeep.com. That's letsdigdeep.com. Now, let's start Digging Deep with former Member of Parliament and the author of Can You Hear Me Now, Selena Caesar Chavan. Selena, it's such a pleasure to welcome you to Digging Deep. I thoroughly enjoyed your book, which is unlike any other political memoir I've ever read, which I think was the idea. Right? That was the intention. Yeah, I don't think I'm like any other politician you may have ever met. So. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And I'm really looking forward to talking about your experience as an entrepreneur, as a leader, as an elected official, because I think you have a lot to share on all those topics. Uh, but let's start by talking a little bit about your childhood. You write about your childhood in your new book. Uh, what would you say is your fondest childhood memory? Oh, my. My fondest childhood memory would be going back home to Grenada. I'm from the small island of Grenada, which is in the Caribbean uh, population less than the town of Whitby. And so uh, going back home was always a breath of fresh air for me because, you know, I could just be myself. I was with my grandparents most of the time, my cousins, and it was, it was a vacation, although I was going home, you know, it was, it was nice. My just uh, the the love of the family on the beach. It's just, yeah, everything about Grenada makes me, <laughs> makes me giddy. <laughs> Sounds nice. Who was your hero when you were 10 years old? Oh, that would be my grandmother, my paternal grandmother, Mrs. Caesar, uh, the formidable force that she was, the entrepreneur, the community activist, the formidable grandmother who was just everything I wanted to be when I grew up. And I love that you called her Mrs. Caesar, even though she was your grandma, right? <laughs> she wasn't a squishy, soft and gushy grandma. She was the, 
she was, you know, iron and, um, but she, we knew that she loved us fiercely. So mm. Mrs. Caesar seemed appropriate. <laughs> Grandma. And what did you think you were going to be when you grew up? Oh, a doctor for sure. A doctor, uh, a neurologist, a neuro neurosurgeon specifically. Uh, yeah, I, I thought that up until maybe second year university. What would you say is your life story in six words? Make mistakes, overcome them fast. Okay. <laughs> and you certainly cover a lot of that in, in the book. That's a big part of your story. Um, yes. and I, I can't wait to dig deeper into that. Um, what is a, an example of a mistake that you've made and what you learned from it? Is there one that you like to share? Yeah, so my entire undergraduate university experience was the biggest, I think the biggest mistake and the, the lowest low. And it's very difficult to, when, you, when you're talking about digging deep, to dig any deeper than that hole I was in. <laughs> so the only place I could have gone was up from, from that point. But it was one of the saddest moments that I've had. Uh, just knowing that, you know, my family came to Canada, the, the one job that we had was education to make sure we did well in school. And then I was continuously year after year, just bombing in university. And what did you learn from that? You know, I, I think when, when you're that low or when I was that low, I learned maybe not in the moment or a couple years after but, you know, a few years after that, just that, that resiliency that I had to be able to, you know, you dig deep when you're that low, you have to now dig deeper into yourself to find what allows you to step back up again, to take one foot in front of the other, and then to go that next step, even when you're in your lowest moment to think something good could come out of this. I actually have a great foundation on education. This might have not been my best moment, but I actually know that I have some really good stuff inside me. And then you could take that one step and then you think, okay, what's the next step? Well, you know, I think I could go back to school and do really well. So you take the next step. And I think that builds that resiliency that's required to then do other formidable things in your life. Great lesson. Uh, for what do you feel most grateful? My children, um, you know, being a mom to these three kids, I have a 21 year old Desiree, a 16 year old Candace and a 12 year old Vidal John, who we call Johnny, uh, the, just the Selena 2.0s of my life that always pushed me to do better, uh, that, you know, look at my story and think, wow, okay, <laughs> we got a mom here. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, they travel the world by themselves. They're just, they're just these kids that are just, they're so much braver than I'll ever be. What has been the best year of your life so far and why? I, oh God, that's a, I've never been asked that question. Uh, the best year of my life, I'm 46 right now. So I'd have to say either 45 or 46. And, you know, that's an interesting answer to that because it was also the most painful year of my life, 45, 46. And it's, it's beautiful because I recognize that through that pain. So all of the stories, all of my pain growing up, I've never actually realized how amazing it could be if you're able to, the cliche, dig deep. <laughs> And, and figure out the beauty and the pain and how it drives the purpose. And the realization of that has been miraculous for me. I love how often you're talking about digging deep. This is perfect. I know. It's, it's like <laughs> it was set up that way. Yeah. <laughs> What's been the toughest year of your life so far? Oh, that year of just before university. Uh, uh, actually, no, I'd say, I'd say 2012. 2012 was when, you know, my husband and I, like, we separated um, half about halfway through the year, we went through, I read about in the book, just saying that, you know, falling in love is easy, you fall fast and furious through an unknown distance and time. And instead of us holding on to each other, as we brace for landing, we let each other go. And that was, that was really tough to, to know that I'd been working so hard at everything else. And 
watching my marriage fall apart. But you guys are in a much better place now. And, yeah. and that's one of the great <laughs> stories, I think, of, of this yeah. book is you, you know, you, you found a way back from that and a lot of couples don't. So that's amazing. Yeah, it, it's, it's interesting. You know, my daughter, when she was reading the book, we have dinners together as a family every night. And you were calling her up, Desiree, come up for dinner. She's like, I'm reading the book. I'm like, well, you know how it ends. It's okay. She's like, oh my gosh. She comes upstairs. She's like, oh, whew. I hope Selena and Vidal make it. <laughs> she, got, <laughs> she was so into this book. <laughs> like, she said it was like reading the backstory of her life, but the dinner conversations after that were very interesting. Yes. I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> what would you say is the one person who's had the greatest impact on your life? The greatest impact on my life would be, you know, it might seem a little unfair, but it'll either be my husband um, because he's always been there for me at these critical pivot points or my eldest daughter, Desiree, because she's, she challenges me in a way that I don't think I'm challenged by much people. You know, she, she pushes me. She loves to be on her own. She's traveled the world at 21. She finished her law degree. She's just so incredible. I just, I just don't even know how I lucked out in being her mom. Oh, that's sweet. And your husband, I, I love the story you told about you were having a really bad day in Ottawa as, mm -hmm. as an MP and you got a knock on the door at seven o'clock in the morning. And it, he had, he had gotten up at three or three 30 in the morning and driven from your home to Ottawa to be with you that day. And he, he just sort yeah. of anticipated that you needed him, right? Yeah, that was actually, that night was the closest I'd ever come to resigning in my role as member of parliament. I just thought it's not worth it. And I don't care how much I have to pay back for someone. Who, I don't, I didn't know what would happen if I resigned, how much it'll cost me to like have another election. I just didn't care. I was going to resign and he showed up. Hmm. What's the most important lesson you've learned that you would share with other people? Oh my goodness. To just be your authentic self. Um, you know, we, we spend so much time hiding parts of who we are, the parts that embarrass and shame us, the parts that we're afraid of and all of those experiences, the mistakes, the hurts, the pain, the shame, the guilt, are added together with our strength, our resiliency, our determination to create who we are and therefore create value as we navigate spaces, irrespective of our education or our work experience, that in and of itself creates value. And when we leave parts of those behind or we hide them, we omit some of that value that has been created. And we spend a lot of time hiding parts of ourselves instead of showing up authentic because I think all of that pain and stuff that it creates the empathy that's required to be authentic in those spaces. Mm, yeah. And, and you shared it all in this book and we're going to come back to some yeah. of that. So uh, what would people be most surprised to learn about you? Um, the one thing I don't think people know, and I'm not even sure if it's in the book, to be honest, is that I'm a, I'm a trained extrovert. I, I don't, I'm a, 100% an introvert. I would right. much prefer to be at home. Even in my house, I prefer to be by myself in my bed, in pajamas, under covers, even in the summertime, um, and not be forward facing or front facing at all. I, I, I don't, I, one of the, the best things about the pandemic is that I don't have to leave my house and I haven't left my house in weeks. Yeah, if not months. <laughs> I can relate to that. But you, you called yourself a trained extrovert, so you've learned how. To I've be, learned, yes, yeah. how to be on outside of my yeah. home, and I, I actually have to turn the switch on, and then and amp myself up, charge that battery, and then when I unplug, I it actually takes a lot to plug it back in and then amp up again. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I got to say, there's parts of me that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm happy with the way things are right now. I'm not happy that it's a, it's a pandemic that's causing it, but not having to go out to events in the evening, you know, not having to make those choices and, so and just, good. yeah, I know. So good. I hear you. Uh, what's your secret talent? 
I have actually, I may have a couple actually. I have um, got up to grade seven in Royal Conservatory of Music playing the piano. Wow. And nobody knows that. <laughs> And I'm a competitive swimmer, which for a lot of black people, it's like, you do what? <laughs> but I was a competitive swimmer for a very long time. Those are two pretty impressive ones. <laughs> What's your boldest prediction for the future? Oh, I hate these questions. I am not sure if I have a bold prediction. I'm such a pessimist. I'm always glass half empty. But if I were to, if I were to be hopeful about the future, I would say that the next generation decides that equity is more important than profit and privilege and power and decide mm. to create a more equitable world. Let's hope. Let's hope. What would be the message of your commencement address if you were speaking to a group of students today? Oh, maybe that one. Maybe I should have used mm. that one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. yeah, over to you, uh, right? <laughs> Next generation. Yeah, over to you, yeah. but but with empathy to use what happened after 2020, recognizing that 2020 wasn't just a series of historical moments. It was a call to action to, to put down the silos that separate us as diverse individuals, talk to each other create those connections that are required to have inclusion, strive towards equity, but that inclusion piece is only, is, is going to help drive the empathy that is required for the equity. And once you get there, once you have that empathy for each other, for your planet, for other living things, certain things like war and refugee crisis and climate change, they tend to take a back seat because we care. Mm. It's all the stuff we learned in kindergarten and somehow forgot as we got older. Yeah. Or it got drummed out of us somehow, right? Somehow. Yeah. Yeah. What's been a recent epiphany for you? Is there something about which you've changed your mind? Is there a recent yeah. discovery you've made? So why that question about the future is so difficult for me to answer is because I actually don't think about it. I, as a type A personality, I've always had plans for next and I've, over the last year in particular, have been very cognizant about living in the now and appreciating the moment that I'm in, the present, the gift that is right now. And so when people say, Selena, what are you going to do next? I say, I'm going to do now next. Mm, I like that. And that's unusual for you, right? Yes, very, <laughs> very much so. <laughs> yeah. What book other than your own are you most likely to recommend to other people? Is there one that's had a big impact oh, on you? The Spark by Christine Burnett. It's a book about a mom. It's the, it's, I use it as the guide of my life. Um, it's about a mom who used her intuition, who even when the powers that be said no and her gut said yes, she did what she needed to do for her children or for her child. And um, it makes me emotional to think about it because she was unwavering in her principles and what she believed. And that I have used, since, I, since reading that book, I've used it in any decision that I've made to just stick to that gut feeling. And even when the powers that be say no, sometimes you could just say yes, and mm. that's okay. Wow. All right, Selena, thank you for answering those questions. In just a moment, we're going to start digging deep with Selena Caesar Chavan. We're just going to take a quick break so I can tell you a little bit more about the presenting sponsor of Digging Deep, ZenBooks. ZenBooks is Canada's go to cloud accounting firm. They are not your typical accounting firm. I know the founders, Colin and Eric, I've worked with them for several years. And here's why I think you should consider working with them, too. First of all, they bring a fresh, unique, modern approach to what is a very old-fashioned industry. These guys were working remotely and in the cloud long before it became cool. ZenBooks also uses technology to your advantage. I think this is really important. They give you the tools and analysis you need to monitor your business in real time. That's so valuable right now when everything changes so quickly. Yes, they're a virtual accounting firm, 
but that doesn't mean they're offshore, and it doesn't mean they're inattentive. Zenbooks combines the efficiency and effectiveness of a cloud accounting service with all the benefits that you'd want from a trusted advisor, high-level advice, and strategic support. Now, here's what I think is going to happen if you work with Zenbooks. You'll probably start out taking advantage of their cutting-edge cloud accounting solutions, but in the long run, I think you'll stay with them because of their strategic guidance and problem-solving. Among their core values, they specifically list being candid and proactive. Isn't that exactly what you want from a trusted advisor? Look, even if you're already working with an accountant or a bookkeeper, or you have some accounting staff on your team, I think you should still talk to ZenBooks and learn more about their tools and their expertise. Check out ZenBooks at zenbooks.ca. That's zenbooks.ca. Digging Deep is all about helping you make better decisions, and so is Abacus Data. Most leaders struggle to connect with and engage their audiences. Why is that? It's because they aren't sure how they think and feel and how they will react. Abacus Data can give you the strategic insights you need to make better decisions and to make them confidently. Here's a good example. A major national union was recently negotiating a new agreement for its thousands of members. This had the potential to be a very difficult process. There were many competing interests. So they brought in Abacus Data to conduct thorough and detailed research of their members to learn exactly where they stood, what they were thinking, what they wanted. And as a result, they were able to secure a strong new deal that was accepted overwhelmingly in a national vote. Abacus Data helps all of its clients understand what's really happening in the minds of their employees, clients, and stakeholders. They help them avoid costly blind spots. And they're really good at what they do. In fact, Abacus Data was one of the most accurate pollsters in the 2019 Canadian federal election. Make the one decision that will improve all of your other decisions. Let Abacus Data help you move forward with confidence and clarity. Go to abacusdata.ca. That's abacusdata.ca. So once again, Selena, it's, it's such a pleasure to speak with you. And I really enjoyed your book. And what I found surprising, to be honest, is there's there's a lot that I relate to in this book, even though I'm a white guy, <laughs> you know, and uh, it's just fascinating to me, all the little things that, you know, I, I had a similar experience to you in terms of being a really strong student in high school, but then struggling at university. Um, there are a couple of other things that arise in your personal life that, that resonated with me as well. Um, so I'm really, you know, it's the great thing about what I do with this podcast is I get to kind of dive into somebody's life for a little while, and then I get to meet them and talk about it, which is what we're doing right now. So it's very cool. So, um, can you talk a little bit about your childhood then? Because you, you did very well in school, but you also got into a little bit of trouble from time to time. And you also had, you know, you had a tough relationship with, your parents, right? And there was, yeah. there was corporal punishment in your life. And, and, and so can you just describe the dynamic of your childhood and, and all the things that were going on? Yeah, there was a lot going on. And I appreciate you saying, first of all, that you saw parts of yourself in the book, because I've heard that so many times and I wasn't expecting it. So thank you for that. I, I wrote it for that reason. So people could see themselves in it and heal from it in, in any way that they could. But my childhood was, again, education was really important for my family coming from Grenada to Canada, wanting to make sure that we had a better life for ourselves. And I think some, in some way in the back of my mind, and I, I wish I dug deeper into it earlier, but now I just don't care anymore. Um, but to really think about the impact of being left back home uh, while my parents came here, what kind of experience that had for me. I came by myself almost two years later, my mother, my father, my brother came here and left me when I was six months. And just thinking what kind of impact that would have had 
but I think I, you know, as I look back and write the book, I think I saw how that played out one of, of a lot of resistance and rebellion. I knew that I had to somehow get on my parents' good graces. And the only way I could do that was being smart and showing up in school and getting A's and that would appease them for a little while. But then I was, you know, I was also very rebellious. I wanted to explore everything at the same time. And if I didn't get permission to go, I just do it myself, whether it was walking home alone in kindergarten, because I didn't want to be left last. I hated being left last or left to the last person or, you know, shoplifting from Becker's. <laughs> I'm sure it was like a five cent candy, which wasn't even worth it. But, um, you know, it was, it was just the constant propensity to either get attention through my grades or get attention through doing stuff that was naughty. And um, that, that tension, that resistance was, you know, met with a mother who was iron. And I dedicated the book to my mom. And I said, she's the iron dedicated to Odessa Caesar, the iron that sharpens me. And that tension of being good and bad at the same time was constantly in friction with this steel that was raising me. Right. And it caused a lot of fire. <laughs> yeah. And can you talk a little bit about the, the punishment that you experienced? Cause you vowed never to do that with your own kids. Um, and, yeah. um, and, you know, obviously you still love your parents, but, but that was, there was some, there was some really harsh, punishment that you received, right? Yeah. So, you know, getting, getting, you know, a beating with a a belt in Caribbean, you know, families is not uncommon. And I just, you know, I just remember the, the pain of that and just thinking, you know, no matter how much trouble I get into it, it, it didn't deter like (laughs) The pain of that didn't deter me from getting in trouble, right. but I just kept which, thinking which is, that in itself is interesting, right? Cause there's a, you know, we, we there's the whole debate over, uh, you know, crime and punishment, right. That, that the right. idea that, that if, if the punishment is harsh enough, then, then nobody's going to, you know, break the law or break the rules or whatever. And it doesn't work that way. Right. No, that, that didn't apply. Yeah. <laughs> that didn't apply to me. Yeah. Um, but I just felt it was so it was so, it was so hurtful. Like I, you know, I didn't understand it. And I, I don't think I really understood. I still don't understand to be quite honest. Um, but you know, I, I write in the book that I feared my mother while my mother feared for me and treated me the way that she thought the world would. And I don't want my children to fear me. I want them to respect who I am. I want them to push the boundaries in terms of, you know, talking back, so to speak, but, you know, standing firm for themselves with authority and doing those kinds of things. But I just don't, I don't want them to be afraid of me, especially in this world where, you know, they're faced with so many other challenges. The last challenge that they need is to come home and face a challenge as well. And I just didn't think that that was, I didn't think it was fair. It's, it wasn't fair to me to be out in in a world that is unfamiliar and cold, like literally most of the year and then come home and have to be afraid. And so I just vowed I'll never, it was less about the actual hitting and it was more about, I don't want you to be afraid of me. I want to be someone that you could trust and know that if you're in trouble, you could come see me and it'll be okay. And have you reconciled all of that with your mom? Yeah. So it was interesting when writing the book, you know, she was, I sent it to her in advance of it being published. And she, you know, would say that she's laughing and crying at the same time. And, you know, I, I understand it, it was that fear. It's the fear of you have one girl child, you're moving from a place with a population that's less than the size of Whitby and coming to a big country where God knows what could happen, right? And I'm sure she had a lot of people saying, you know, in Grenada, well, why are you going to that big country? Well, you know, why are you doing that? There's per- everything's perfectly fine here. And so that the, all of those tensions and just wanting to make sure that things are okay, you know, you, it was a hyper protection over me. It was really a hyper protection. And I just thought, 
y'all are nuts. Like (laughs) you could try all you want, but I'm going to not be protected that easily. So yeah, there was, there was a lot of resistance and we had a, we had some good laughs over it because I really, really did give her a hard time. And it ended up that you, I mean, you went through some, some stuff right before university and early in university where you were, I mean, you were forging report cards and, and you even, you You name it. Yeah. You made up a letter that you gave to your parents that said you'd been accepted into medical school and you hid other stuff from them. So, I mean, and then it all kind of blew up and then, and that sort of became a new starting point for you almost. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I always say that things happen in your life for a reason. You know, I couldn't imagine if I didn't have that experience, got into politics and then something happened where I needed to like, where I was suddenly, you know, trying to fandango my way out of it. And I learned that lesson privately enough, early enough in my life that I never did it again. Like it was just, it was, oh my gosh, the, the tangled web that we weave yeah, I don't even want, I don't even like spiders anymore. <laughs> like, I don't <laughs> want to see a web. I don't want to know about web. I don't want to have anything to do with webs or spiders or anything. And so it's interesting that that sort of mess that I was creating, that Ponzi scheme that I was creating for myself happened when it did and had impact. But like I said in the book, you know, I, I still stayed in sort of brain research and it was like the universe was saying, okay, you really messed this up. You are not going to be a neurosurgeon, not going to happen for you, but things are going to be okay. Don't worry about it. Here are the little signs as the universe unfolded that I was still going to be okay. And I'm just, I'm really, so only, you could only see that when you're looking back and I'm really glad that it happened at that young age, right? The only yeah. thing is, though, the other side to that is that, you know, my career didn't get started until really late. So, you know, while other people were starting their career after four years of university, it took me six years. And then I had to go back to undergrad and then start through all of that again. So I was years behind, you know, my counterparts. Yeah. But what I like about what you just said is that it's almost like, um, you know, you can picture people who, uh, and everybody's journey is different, obviously. And it's, and it's, it's partly, uh, you know, within your control and a lot of it's not, but you can picture somebody who has built a perfect track record. Right. And Mm -hmm. then it's, then it's about preserving the shutout more than it's about kind of being in the game and absorbing the hits and the, and the bounces. Right. Whereas you, you kind of had this explosion happen in your life at a young age, and then you were able to move forward. And it's like, you know what, my life is not going to be perfect. I'm ready for the, for the, you know, swings and misses and the home runs. And as opposed to somebody who's just super tense, just trying to preserve that perfect track record as they get older, and then it blows up later. Right. Well, exactly. And I was tense trying to preserve this perfect track record. That was a total sham. And so there's just, there's so many parts of that, that I just never want to experience again in that, that happened in those six years that were so life-changing for me that, you know, when people say, and I talk about it later in the book, when they say, do you, do you have any regrets about any of this? I'm like, no way. You know, they, they, they happened for a reason and I needed to learn those lessons, I needed to get to that lowest point to be able to then say, okay, how do I build that resilience? How do I get that perseverance? How do you get that determination to go back as an undergrad with, you know, two kids and a husband and, oh my God, like, yeah, there's, there's so many things in there that could be impact. There's a difference between having regrets and having things you would do differently the second time yes. around. Right. Yeah. And sometimes those two things are conflated, but they're, yeah. they're two different things, right? Cause yes, for yeah. sure. For sure. Yeah. Uh, as an aside, by the way, I, I love how you wrote early in the book that uh, you became very good at swearing when you were a kid. And then of course, part of your story in politics is dropping the F bomb on the prime minister of Canada. Right. So <laughs> It's, Blame Robert for that. <laughs> Wonder whatever happened to Robert. <laughs> um, so let's uh, 
move forward a little bit because when you um, you talked about th- this concept of mistake, right? Mistake, yeah. like as in a as in a personification of mistake. Ms. Yes. Take. Ms. Take. Yeah. Yes. Tell me more about that. Well, Ms. Take is you know she she was someone that I I dreaded. I hated her, um, as I talk about in the book, and. You know, I, I created this persona when, you know, years later, when you realize how much Ms. Take influences your life and she comes in and she leaves you with all kinds of gifts of guilt and shame and, and, you know, sadness after she, she shows up as Ms. Take. And you could either at that point decide that you're going to take her gifts or you're going to challenge her and say, no, 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 I, I'm not, I don't want that mistake. I mean, I don't want those hurts or guilt. I want the lesson. I'll take the lesson that you're trying to teach me at this moment. And I will then go forward with the lesson. That's the gift that I want from you. And it took, it took me a while to realize that Ms. Take is actually one of the smartest women that I know, because she actually doesn't just show up and def- by default, give you those gifts of shame. She can give you a gift of lessons, but you actually have to ask for it. You have to be willing to say, no, 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 I don't want those. I want that. I want that thing over there, the lesson. And, and then she gives it to you, but you have to be patient enough with yourself, reflective enough in yourself to then understand that she's willing to give that as well. Yeah, I love that. And that's that. something we haven't done. We d- see nobody teaches you that. And so I wrote a book on it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know what I picture when you're talking about it right there is almost like uh, she's running a little corner store and you go in and all of like right at the checkout is all of the, uh, you know, the, the, the equivalent of the candy and the lottery yeah. tickets is, is all the sort of negative stuff associated with mistakes. But yes, but if you ask for it, you know, she'll go in the back room and come back, come back out with the thing you really need from the experience. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. So all of the sort of quick things that you could get are right at the front. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, and then she goes back in and gets the nutrient dense things <laughs> that, you know, give you, give you the, just as much satisfaction, but last longer is healthier. Yeah. It allows you to live better. That is the lesson, but you, you can't, if you want some, if you just blindly turn your eye and walk away or dismiss it, you're just going to get the empty calorie stuff. Right. The guilt. And, and that's the, shame the thing that, that you don't yeah. want. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I really like that. So is it true that you sent out your resume 732, 32. 732 yes. times, and that yes. produced a tiny number of interviews and no jobs after you, after you graduated? Four interviews, two second interviews and no jobs. Wow. And you know, everybody says that when you sent out a resume, you have to like follow up. So I put it in a folder that said, you know, follow up. And then once you follow up, then it goes into like, okay, wait for it. Right. <laughs> and so I had, a, I had all of them numbered and well, not numbered, but when you go into the folder, I looked and it was 732. I was just like, this is not, this is not wow. good. So you started your own business. Um, I didn't have a choice. <laughs> Um, and, and what did you learn from that? I, there's, there's a lesson in there that I thought was really cool, which is you, you didn't have a money to spend on marketing. So you started writing letters to the editor of these trade publications. So the, the business for those people who don't know is in the area of, of medical research, basically, right. Clinical yes. research. And, yeah. and so you started writing letters to the editor of, of medical journals and trade publications and that sort of thing to create profile for yourself. And it worked, right. Well, I didn't have the marketing budget or the communications budget. And every time somebody would call and say, do you want to put out an ad in like, you know, clinical trials magazine? I'd say, oh, sure. Well, how many, 50,000. Like, well, you know, we, we just expended our budget for this quarter. And <laughs> <laughs> um, but then I, I figured, well, there's some free publications. So I would subscribe to all the free ones. And then I'd read them cover to cover and I'd write letters to the editor. And when the letters were published, I'd make sure that I, that the signatory would be my name and, 
you know, the company name and, you know, a little bit about the company or whatever they'd allow me or I'd push them to allow me to, to include. And that created some buzz around, well, who is this person who's, you know, all of a sudden this expert in clinical research. And it was just because I did, I just didn't have the budget to do otherwise, but I needed the advertising. Yeah. Well, it's so clever. And I mean, it it's like a pre-internet version of posting yes. a whole bunch of stuff on LinkedIn to be a thought leader in that's a space, correct. right? Yes, yeah. that's correct. And, yeah. and it was everywhere too. So it was like the, the original social media buzz that was every time I read the magazine, I see this Resolve Research Solutions, the Selena, who is she? Yeah. There. So <laughs> You're a black woman, a young black woman with a family owning a business uh, in an area that is, you know, there aren't a lot of women, let alone black women. Um, there is even underrepresentation in the research that a company like yours would have been carrying out at that time. Yes. Um, so what did you learn from that whole experience of owning your business in those circumstances? You know, I, I'm not sure I was really cognizant of um of all of that the dynamics of all of that I was really just trying to hustle at that point like it was about the hustle for me and I knew I interesting enough I did not put my picture or my name on a lot of my material either so anytime I'd send stuff to the trade publications it would be resolve research solutions inc my logo and then a little description of the company, not me. And so if they needed a description with me, I was very hesitant to do so. I do so, but I'd always put the company name. And it was, it was about just saying, I don't want to have to deal with if, if in fact there could possibly be any racism or sexism within this, this industry, I don't want to have to deal with it. So I didn't, it wasn't a, an issue because I had erased that issue right from the beginning. And by the time I started getting profile, the company was really, was really big and winning awards. So it didn't matter at that point. So what did you take away from the experience of being a business owner and, and how did that kind of shape your perspective going forward? Well, I mean, there's, there's a lot of responsibility with clinical research, right? So just being someone in that domain. And I think, this is where it played into my head about being a woman and a black woman and a young person. So those intersecting identities, I just couldn't make mistakes. So I was very hyper concerned about ensuring that the sites that I selected, the people that I work with to run clinical trials, the data that we were producing was, you know, top notch every single step of the way. And if we couldn't recruit, or if I, if I knew intuitively that the, the research wasn't going to be good, or if they were like, you know, testing one new drug against a, you know, a lower version, like not a, a brand name, then I wouldn't do it. Cause I just couldn't afford to have my reputation get snagged in any sense, in any way. And it was, I learned a lot about personal branding. So I became the company. So it didn't matter whether they were asking for Selena or asking for Resolve Research, we were one in the same. And the brand that was carried with both of them, the marketing, the communications, how people saw me, what people saw of me were incredibly important. So I didn't have social media, even when it came out after, uh, the, you know, when the company was a lot older, just because I just didn't want to have to deal with any of that the slightest possibility that there would be some, you know, picture that somebody didn't like on there or something like that. So I just, I, you know, I had to really protect the brand. Mm. So let's switch tracks for a moment and just talk about what you're going through personally at that time. And I mentioned yes. to you that I found many things in the book, very relatable. And one of them was, that you suffered a couple of miscarriages. Um, yes. My wife and I went through that ourselves in between our two kids. So we, oh, okay. we had a son shortly after we got married and then, and, and we were, we got married. I, I was 40 and my wife was 37 when we got married. So if we were going to have kids, it was, you know, we were, right. the clock was ticking. So, right. so we were in a hurry to have a couple of kids and between mm -hmm. our two children being born, we, we lost a couple of kids and I, I related very much to what your experience was. And, and it's an area that 
almost nobody talks about, right? It's sort of this whole thing that's, you know, and, it, and it's even, um, it's almost like they sit, like they tell you, don't talk about your pregnancy until you get to three months. And then that way you won't have to talk about if something goes wrong. So it's almost built into the, the concept of pregnancy that, that, you know, that this thing can happen and, and you should keep it a secret. Right. Yeah. And that I found, you know, the first time, the first miscarriage, I kept it a secret and that was just devastating. And then, the, cause I thought it was my fault. And no matter how many times somebody said, it's not your fault. My cousin worked at the, at the neonatal um, clinic at Mount Sinai. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. I was just like, yeah, that, I'm sure that's what they tell everybody, but this clearly was my fault. I'm a hothead. I was angry in the morning. And then when I had the second one, you know, finally someone said to me, Oh, I, you know, me hashtag me too, before it even was a thing. Right. And I was just like, it was just the sigh of relief. Like, why don't people talk about that? How many other women has have had a miscarriage? Like, did anybody ever have one before? Like nobody taught, you know, it's out there like, yeah. somewhere, but nobody talks about it. So there are so many women, even that I talk to now that are living with this immense burden. And so you have this burden, you're trying to get pregnant again. You have this guilt. You're not able to rest. You're not able to just relax and enjoy the next pregnancy because you're guilty and you're so like, there's just a whole bunch of stressors on top of stressors on top of stressors. And it's just like, just, just talk about it. Yeah. Well, thank okay. you for sharing your story publicly, because I'm sure that will have a huge impact on, on, on women who are experiencing this, yeah. uh, and have, have, you know, and, and would otherwise go through it like you thinking it's your fault or yes. it's, it's, uh, rarer than it really is. Right. Um, right. likewise, you talk about, uh, the challenges you faced with your mental health and, mm -hmm. and a couple of dark periods for you. Um, yes. Can you talk a little bit about what was going on at those times, what you were experiencing and how you got through it? Yeah. So, you know, working in, in clinical research in the, in the field of neurological research, I had performed plenty depression scales to know that I was depressed. So Start off with that caveat that she knew she was depressed before she got an official diagnosis, which, mm. mo which doesn't happen for most people. And I say that because I, even knowing that I would fail a depression scale, still didn't go get the help that I was, that I needed because that's what depression does to the mind. It depresses it. And therefore you don't seek the help that you need. And, you know, I, I would say that the first started, you know, having, um, postpartum depression with my daughter that I never even my firstborn that I never even considered. I just thought, well, you know, I feel bad, you know, and I'm kind of disconnected from her, but that's okay. Meh. And then, you know, going into, you know, the, the challenges with my marriage and things like that, there were just, there was just so many signals that I should have gotten some more concrete help. And it was all too late by the time I, I ended up, you know, having a nervous breakdown in Sunnybrook, you know? Um, but even then, you know, before, like when the, just before the, my election going and, and getting diagnosed, that's, that's the hardest part or part of the hardest part. The second hardest part for me was saying, okay, now that you have the diagnosis, it actually means you need to slow down lady. You need to like, just take a break. The, you know what? And I always like whisper to myself because you know what? The world keeps spinning, even when you take a break. And I wasn't doing that. And it took getting into complete crisis before I actually maybe fully understood, okay, you need to take a break now. Are you better at that now? Because you, you also, you know, you it's clear. And I think you even sort of diagnose this in yourself that you are always sort of what's next, right? Like I just did this. Now I'm going to do this. Now I'm going to, you know, you've, you, you did two MBAs, you, you, you ran for office, you know? So, um, ha have you gotten better at, at pausing, reflecting, having some downtime? Yeah. 
Um, so I, I didn't get there quickly. I just, I just actually arrived. I just put the keys on the counter. <laughs> <laughs> I just got here, um, where I'm able to say that I am just going to enjoy now. And I'm not going to worry so much about what happens next or how it happens or anything like that. I'm just, I'm so chill, but that took me actually understanding that there is not one treatment to depression or anxiety. It takes a bunch of different things that I need to do in concert. So for the first time in my life, I'm actually compliant with my medication. I meditate on a regular basis. I read different spiritual books that allow me to understand how to be more present. It is a practice of not just a a straight out doing of it's a, it's a practice and it takes practice. And as with practicing, sometimes you're going to fail. Sometimes you're going to do really well, but you have to practice it every day in order to get to yourself feeling better. And that's where I am with, you know, trying to eat healthier, trying to be healthier. But also I think the major part for me was the meditation practice and the spiritual practice, which could have only happened because because I was a politician and I was a practicing Catholic, I had people protest at my church. So I couldn't go to church, which was def- which I thought was devastating. But if we go back to our earlier conversations about things happen for a reason, I couldn't go to church. So I had to pick up these other spiritual side- sorts of things. And it helped with that practice of being a little bit more present and understanding that it's not about the religion, but it's about this, this connecting spiritually. Mm. And and so much about that is interesting to me. And what, what uh, it makes me think about is how, if we want to get in good physical shape, I think we all acknowledge that that takes a practice of some kind, right? Yes. That you've got to go yes. to the gym five times a week or three times a week. You've got to run or ride a bike or, and you have to yeah. sustain that. And you can't just stop all of a sudden and, and sustain that, that shape you get in. So it is a practice, but when it comes to our mental health, we don't right. think of it that way. We wait until something goes wrong. Then we try to fix it and think that we just fix it and then leave it alone again as opposed to what does it take to sustain good mental health the way we would sustain good physical health, right? 100% exactly. And that, that practice requires a lot of mental sort of stuff, right? So that's, so it's, it's eating, it's exercise, but it's also the stuff that you consume through visually. So there's, there's movies and shows that I just know based on the description, I won't watch, you know, that are, you know, Oh my God, you have to watch this X, Y, Z. And it's like, what is it about? Oh no, no, I'm not doing that. Just in here and hearing the description, I know where it's going to send me. And I'm not interested in that. Even and what, at like a what someone kind of who, category of thing is that like what, what sorts um, of shows would send you in the wrong direction? Yeah. So my, my, so there's, so I don't watch any horror films or anything like that. That's just not happening at all, but anything to do with inequity, Mm. like there was, um, you know, like the, the movie about the, the central park five, Mm -hmm. I, I started watching it. It took me about five hours to watch 45 minutes because I had to like pause it and then go. And then I was just like, you know what? I, I, I cannot watch it in as much as I want to know the story or, or, or watching, you know, George Floyd. I haven't seen that nine minutes. I will not watch that. I, I can't see any of it because I can't unsee it. And I know that it would, it would absolutely put me it. I will go into a dark space in my own head that I won't be able to come out of. And I just don't want to do that. Right. So, and obviously it's not that the, it's not important or relevant. It's just not the way you want to consume that information. Right. It's not, that's not going to produce a healthy outcome for you. No, yeah. no. And it, it, it actually is quite debilitating for me. So mm. like I, I tried to watch that movie of, the, of those, those boys. And I just, because it was so important because it's a moment in our history where they were exonerated. And I just, I felt like I needed to honor them by, by seeing their story. And I just, 
and nothing, ha- nothing really happens in that first 45 minutes. I just couldn't unsee well, you know where their going, faces. Right? Pardon yeah. me? You know where it's going, right? So, I know where it's yeah. going and I, and yeah. their children. Yeah. Right. So it goes back to like me, how I felt even when I was young, just knowing that pain, that hurt, that anguish of something being unfair and just saying, no, I, I, I can't, I will fight for that, but I don't need to consume it through sound, through visuals. I don't need to do that. Mm. Since we're on that subject and, and George Floyd and everything that happened in 2020, do you, uh, you talked earlier about a call to action and, and everything that has resulted from that. Do you have any level of confidence that something has changed in the last year or so? Because I I fear uh, whenever one of these sort of milestone events happens, that there is kind of a pronouncement that, okay, you know, we're never going to let this happen again. Um, And then, and then it happens again. And we could go back to Rodney King, which you reference in your book, um, which is, which is a long time ago now. So what, how do you feel about all of that? And the, have we crossed a threshold yet? I I can't be absolutely certain yet. Um, So I'm very pessimistic by nature and I see the glass half empty, not because I want to be a, a, you know, down on anybody all the time, but because the urgency of now requires that we don't let up the gas. And if I saw it as half full, I'd, you know, take my foot off the pedal and put us, put us in cruise for a little while. And I just don't think we could go in cruise right now. We just, it's a moment that I don't know if we'll ever be able to see again. So if we're not going to seize this moment, one, and then two, capitalize on it. So I think a lot of people right now are seizing the moment, meaning they understand the urgency. They see that it's happened. They're putting money toward it or blacking out their social media or putting hashtag black lives matter, but are they capitalizing it? Are they understanding how they could use this moment to turn their organizations, their institutions, their schools, their country around and capitalize from equity. And there is a cost, you know, McKinsey in 2019 did the cost of a racial inequity before George Floyd. And it was valued at one to $1.5 trillion, 6% of the US economy, not having equity. So are we going to use this moment to capitalize? Not that we're commodities, because I always get people saying, well, you're commoditizing us. Yeah, well, have we always been commodity? I guess we have, right? But now it's about leveraging our human yeah. capital, leveraging that human resource for something good. Well, you're making an economic argument for a social justice uh, right. principle, which is okay. I'm I, because I like I I always wonder why you know if there's a problem in the world, why would we not want everybody available to solve that problem? Yes. yes. Uh, rather than just white men, you know, yes. why wouldn't we want? Uh, you know, maybe there's, maybe there's a girl who has the solution to this. Maybe there's a person of color, maybe there's an indigenous person who has the solution, but, but until very, very recently, and still to some extent today, we, we're not looking, you know, we're not creating a world where everybody can become Leonardo da Vinci or Steve Jobs. We're creating Mm -hmm. a world where only white guys can. Right. And that's, this is where I, I talk about, you know, the value that has been created because I have to navigate the same world as you, but I have to go over barriers and through challenges. So how much richer is my experience of navigating schools or workplaces or entrepreneurship to add to then a policy development or a product or service that's being launched? I'm able to see that product or service policy from a totally different perspective, as too would another Black 46-year-old woman standing right beside me. We will have a different perspective, but we'd be able to see things differently. So if you're only bringing in certain perspectives into this mix, you're, you're, you're leaving some of that 6% of the GDP behind. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and you're also, like you just pointed out, I mean, uh, you're, you're asking uh, somebody who uh, 
has a winning lottery ticket, how to get rich in a way, right? Like if you're just going to, to, to white men exactly. and saying, how do you solve problems? Well, the, you know, I'm speaking for myself here, but I mean, I haven't had prob. I, I you know, most of the, yeah. most of the problems that people, most that lots of other people have had in their lives, I haven't had. So the, the last thing you want is a bunch of people who are confusing uh, luck with merit to be telling right. you how to overcome obstacles. Right. 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 And, and just, and just the understanding too, if I may, that when you create equity, when you add people to organizations or you mix it up, this isn't about somebody taking your slice of the pie or cutting into your slice of the pie. It's about adding my value to your value so that we can make a bigger pie so that everybody gets a slice and everybody eats. Right now, we're holding a very small pie with only certain people getting a slice. And equity doesn't, it, it doesn't make your slice any smaller. No, it doesn't. It's not limiting in any way. No, it's yeah. not a zero sum game. Yeah, it exactly. is the opposite of that. Yeah. Um, so we haven't even talked yet about your political career, uh, which yeah. is, uh, and, and there's so much we could get into there, but I'm, I'm curious now that you've had a little bit of distance from it, uh, mm -hmm. it's been about 18 months uh, since you since you left office, I guess. Um, how do you look back on that and what you learned from that experience of, of stepping up, uh, being elected in a place that had never elected a black woman before, being the only black woman in, in parliament, uh, your experiences uh, with the prime minister and with power in Ottawa, what... What are some of your reflections now? So I call being in politics one of the most painfully beautiful experiences that I've had. Uh, you know, there were a lot of challenges related to just the institution itself. The institution, as everybody should know, was built on exclusionary principles. So women weren't, you know, allowed to vote, Indigenous people, people of color and then th those exclusionary principles of, of status quo were reinforced by years and years of policy that reinforced that status quo. And, you know, showing up there, I felt, I felt that there's no representation or very, very little representation of, of Black people contributing to our democracy. So th there was a sense of isolation, even from the infrastructure and then there was this, this constant, you know, reminder that I didn't really belong in the sense that I was never given access, even up to June of 2019. So I was elected in October, 2015, even in June of 2019, I'm leaving my office for the last time, or I'm coming in to just get my boxes and, and leave. And I'm asked by security, can I help you? And I'm like, for the umpteenth time I am a member of parliament which you know you people said oh you know Selena you're being a diva blah 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 that that's not the point the point is it's, it's one thing to not feel like you belong but in a place like that where I've had death threats I've been sued I've had media like I didn't feel safe so if they can't recognize me on a regular day what happens if there's a shooting or there's a an unfortunate incident on the hill I feel, I felt as if, you know, they pushed me out of the way. Like, let me go sell you, say Bill Morneau, <laughs> get out of the way lady. So I didn't, I, there was, it wasn't safe for me. And so, you know, all of those things happened, but even with all of that and, and a lot more, I call it beautiful because I recognized how powerful my voice is and how very much my principles and values are anchored by some of the pain that I've gone through in my life. And therefore I am unwavering when it comes to my principles and values and my unwavering in my advocacy for people that I don't ever want to feel that pain. I don't want them to feel the pain that I felt. So if I could advocate, if I could rattle the cages for them and amplify their voices, then I'll do that every day and Sunday. Mm. I wanted to talk about the challenge that I think you faced and that other people face as well around, 
you enter a system and there's a requirement to some extent that you have to play by the rules within the system, but then you also are trying to challenge that system, right? And, yeah. and the risks associated with challenging that system as a black woman who is then going to be portrayed as, you the know, the angry the, black woman exactly. trope. Exactly. Yeah. Um, what was, you know, because, because there is still, um, something to be said for the idea that if you want to change something, you do have to participate. You do have to operate from within the system, right? So there's, there is a balance there somewhere, isn't there? So the first thing is, um, the rules that were written or unwritten were established without me or anyone looking like me being there. So I'm, I'm quite certain that those rules do not apply to me. <laughs> Amen. I, and I, I realized that in September of 2017, like it was a very con conscious decision to, to drop the gloves and to say, you know what, Selena, you are trying to fit into a world or to rules that were written with someone with limited imagination to what could happen and the possibilities of you showing up. So stop trying to fit into these written or unwritten rules and start showing up for your constituency. Start, start acting in the best interest of the people, of the democracy, of the power of the people and not the political will that is stifled by its inability to, to get rid of power or privilege. And that decision was very, very conscious. And so, yes, you have to play by the rules and you have to work with people within the system. And, you know, um, ensuring that we got a $5 billion commitment to in the 2017 budget towards mental health says that I could play by the rules. But there's some times where the political will is not moving or so still that it, it stifles actually what is the, what is good for the people. So in re repealing mandatory minimums, for example, there was no amount of convincing that could have happened in that government that would have allowed for the repeal of mandatory minimums because it wasn't politically expedient to do so. The challenge of, well, if we do this, we might lose the next election because the conservatives will think we're soft on crime. Is that how you, how do you, how you create policy? Is that how you do or don't do? So the challenge for me was to decide, well, do we stay in the system and, you know, go along to get along or do we disrupt? Easy choice for me, somebody who is not wavering with their values and principles, that's a very easy choice, will disrupt. Good for you. Uh which leads to a point, and, and I'm, uh, I'm not going to repeat what you're saying in the phone call with the prime minister, but at a certain point, you end up in this phone call where you end up very upset with how he's basically yeah. managing you, right? Yes. Uh, can yes. you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, you know what, naive, very naively. So let me just give, give your, your listeners a little bit of context. 2016, uh, elected October 2015, 2016 was the year that I that I titled tokenism, right? I was only sent on three international events and everybody knows the prime minister in that first year was, went to hundreds of international events. As his parliamentary secretary, I went to three um, and they were all black focused events in which I had no other responsibility but to sit and be a woman and be black. That was it. I had no meetings, no anything else. Right. The, the which, which suggests to, to, you know, it based on, and I, I'm a big believer that, that we have to judge pe people based on their behavior and their choices and not their intentions. And, right. and so I'm not questioning anybody's intentions. I'm simply looking at the behavior as right. you did. It suggests that, that you serve only one purpose to him which is right. to, be, to be the black woman who can go to events that are related to either being black or being a woman or both. Right. Right. And, and not say anything. So it essentially yeah. not be used for my brain. Right. So you're not leveraging the value that I could bring. And then in 2017, again, not leverage for my brain. So I'm now domestic. I have an international development portfolio, but I'm excluded from every single conversation about a budget that is going to come in the next year 
related to the recognition of the UN Decade for People of African Descent and the first time ever investment into Black communities across Canada. I'm excluded from that because, of course, I'm starting to speak up more. I'm starting to like actually push the government to do things a little bit bolder, and they don't want no, none of that. And then 2018, I'm gaslit because I'm talking about racism and I'm not being protected by my party. So all those things happen. Naively enough, Mark, I actually thought in that phone call in 2019 that the prime minister was going to call and say, I'm really sorry that you're not running and that I would really like you to reconsider. You're a part of our team. I re really value you. Instead, he told me that I couldn't leave because that same day Jody Wilson were able to resign and he couldn't have two powerful women of color leave his cabinet at this, leave his government at the same time. It reflected poorly on him. I was told that, you know, people keep talking to him about his privilege. Um, how th there was just, there was a few other things that I can't remember right now, but it, it, the long, the short of it was he was speaking to me as if I didn't have 130,000 people that I represented standing behind me. He was talking to me like a black woman. He was being completely misogynistic and expecting that once he told me to do something that I would acquiesce quite politely and do as he wished. And I was in no mood at that point for that conversation. <laughs> to say the least, yeah. To say, and, to say the very least. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what do you, again, how do you, now that some time has passed, um, what do you think about all those events and about what that, because um, I, I think there is something inherently sexist about it and, and, and also racist about it. But I think there's also something that reflects that um, that that MP there's something that reflects our political system, which is that that MPs effectively report to the prime minister. Like they're it's right. they're, they're not employees of their constituents; they're employees of the leader of the party. Right? That that's kind of how politics works, even though it shouldn't. And that's why I say I guess I'm not your typical politician. Yeah, because I never reported to him. He was never my boss. My boss was the people of Whitby. My allegiance and my, my devotion was to the people of Whitby, the people that gave me the borrowed job that I had in the first place. And that was very clear to everybody inside that political party that I, he's, he's not my boss. I don't know why you keep calling him the boss. Like he may be your leader, but my leader are the people here, the 130,000 people that voted for me. And the, the thing is, is that this town where not only am I the first black woman or, or person of color elected here, um, this town was conservative. So I didn't just, I didn't get elected because only liberals voted for me and therefore I should toe the party line. I got elected because a lot of people who were disenfranchised from the system decided to vote for me. A lot of conservatives said, if you're going to be authentic, you're going to you know, be a straight shooter. I'll vote for you. A lot of people who said, look, there's things that I want. I'm not going to vote for, for the NDP. I'm going to vote for you. And I'm going to expect that you're going to keep or hold them to the fire to keep these promises. I was not about to break any of those promises to appease somebody with a different title than me. Myself and Justin Trudeau got into that position in the exact same way. We went out, we knocked on doors, we got elected. He had a different title. That's it. Mm. I wish more of it, uh, you know, more of politics operated that way. And there's so much we could get into there, but I'm, uh, we're, we're running out of time. There, there's a couple of words I want to bring up with you because they're, they're yes. words that appear in your book. And, and I think I, I found it interesting to kind of look at, at your interpretation of those words. One is that you, you draw a distinction between diversity and inclusion that I think yes. is an important one. Can you, can you elaborate on that? Yes. So diversity is ubiquitous. You know, it's, it's, you know, you go to the grocery store, you go to the schools, you go to the community center, you see people of diverse backgrounds, religions, 
thoughts, etc. So it's everywhere. You don't have to look very hard in a multicultural country like Canada for diversity. It's a, it's, you know, when we hear diversity as our strength, it's a really low bar to set for your, for yourself. Yeah. Um, it's not much not of an accomplishment, strength. right? It's right. Just it's, to it's have a lot of people. Default. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously you can argue we, you know, we, we have more diversity than other countries that are more homo- hom- homo- homogenous, but, uh, but, and there's some, but that's still, that's but, still is not the strength, right? Yeah, exactly. So the strength yeah. is when you leverage that diversity and have intentional connections made between those diverse people. So if you are intentional about acting and about having those connections made and they're sustainable, that is where you have, where you start building towards inclusion. So you have an inclusive, inclusive space where people are now in a space and irrespective of their diversity, they're able to now connect and have those conversations that are beyond the surface, beyond the fact that I'm black, beyond the fact that I'm a woman and you're, you're now looking into my brain. That is the strength in where you start to see that inclusivity, where you start to use the diversity that you have for something greater than just being diverse. It's about being inclusive and inclusive is an, is an intentional action towards making connections with diverse people. Yeah, that's such a great point because you can have diversity and still have um, people of color having no power at all and not having good jobs and not having opportunities. There's still diversity there, but there isn't inclusion. Right. Yeah. And we see that playing out right now where we see COVID-19, you know, that the social determinants of health are killing people. COVID-19 isn't killing people right now, especially in Toronto, where 52% of the population is racialized. And 80% of the burden of the disease is, is on them. Why? Because our systems are such. Are, are such. So, you know, we, we have to think about how inclusive we are. And again, it speaks to that earlier conversation about empathy. Do you have the empathy enough to see that these people are disproportionately impacted and do something about it? The other word that I wanted to bring up is authenticity. And you've touched on it already. And um, and you you talk about finding your voice. And I think mm-hmm. I find that interesting. I, um, I I had a conversation with Tracy Moore, the television broadcaster yes. about this subject as well. She's fantastic. Um, <laughs> she was a guest on the podcast. And, and what I find interesting about it is it's not something that I've ever had to, I mean, I guess everybody does in a way, but there's a greater challenge for you as a black woman to to, to find your voice and, and to decide where you're, you know, what you're comfortable saying and how you're going to say it. Right. So everything that I do is political, right? My hair is political. How my face looks, do I smile all the time or do I just go like this? Because if I go like this, that means I'm angry. Right. Do, do like ever do the, the shirt I wear, the clothes I wear, the heels I put on or whether I put on my sneakers, everything I do is assessed right? Because everything that has been about me as a human being has been legislated at some point or another. And so, you know, when we talk about authenticity, you you know, we talked about the angry black woman trope. So do I want to be the angry black woman trope? And it's it's funny, Michelle Rempel actually talked to me about this first, because I said to her one time, I said, I don't want to fall into that category. And she said, they're going to talk about you anyway, Selena, how are you going to show up? And we don't want to be that trope. So we soften ourselves or I soften myself. Okay, don't be too angry. Don't sound mad. Don't be passionate because that will come across as angry. Don't, um, don't walk with confidence in a space because then it'll be cocky. Don't, um, you know, keep your hair straight and make sure that you don't put too much makeup on and like have a soft features because you don't want to be too like, I'm black and I'm proud kind of person. You just, you just have to just conform, please. That is a lot of work. Mm. And I believe me, I have tried a lot of for mental this day, energy too. a lot of mental energy to, okay, Selena, today we're going to go in and we're going to try to be, you have to remember to smile and we're not going to do this and we're not going to do that. And don't walk too heavy. No, your heels are clicking. Stop making your heels click. Just, and no you know what, Mark, I'm angry, I'm black, and I'm a woman, because people are dying, 
We have an overrepresentation of Black people in jail. We have an overrepresentation of Black children in our, in our welfare system. Our kids are dropping out of school. They're not, they're being streamed into programs where they do not have a, a, a competitive advantage in this global economy. I am a Black woman who's angry. I am the trope. Call me what you want. You're going to talk about me anyway. And it's when we leave that authenticity be behind, we have to decide which authentic self shows up. We have to code switch. We have to do those things that most people don't even think about. They, I'm sure you walk into rooms and you're like, or walk into a bank. When I go to a bank, Mark, I have to like get dressed up. I can't go to my, when my Walmart clothes to the bank, they'll hold my checks for like 10 days. I have to get dressed, put on the heels, put on, that's why I don't go to the bank. I said, my husband, he puts on a suit every day to go to work. Good. You have the suit on already go to the bank. Cause it's just too much effort. The, these things that people take for granted, I cannot take for granted because it just makes my life miserable. If I don't sort of conform or adjust my authenticity, depending on the circumstance. Well, I'm glad you found your voice and I'm glad your voice is so strong and powerful. And uh, I'd, I'd love to keep talking, but, but I'm conscious of the time. This has been so interesting and informative and reading your book. I learned so much from that. And our conversation has been an absolute delight. Thank you so much for being with us today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Mark. And, and this conversation was, it really was um, lovely. And digging deep into some of these conversations allow people to understand, you know, my context a little bit better, uh, other people's context a little bit better. And, and digging deep is what brings that empathy again, that allows us to get closer to equity. So I thank you for using your platform to have these conversations, because if the world is going to be a better place, if we're going to have justice, if we're going to have equity, then we need to have these platforms. So thank you very much. Well, can you imagine yourself in that kind of conversation with the Prime Minister of Canada? You've got to admire Selena Cesar Chavan for taking that kind of stand. I also really like the point that she made about how diversity is just what happens, but inclusion is what we really should strive toward. Don't you find that sets the bar a little higher? I really appreciated her candor and her honesty and all of the challenges that she put in front of all of us. So once again, thank you to Selena Caesar Chavan for joining us on Digging Deep. If you enjoyed this episode, please review it and please share it with others. That will help us produce more great episodes. And if you want to keep digging deep into topics and lessons like this, you can see the show notes. You can subscribe to our weekly newsletter. Every week I share five things I learned about that week. You can also read my blog. You can do all of that at letsdigdeep.com. That's letsdigdeep.com. And get ready for more great stories and powerful lessons on the next episode of Digging Deep. Thank you for listening. Yeah.